So today we can continue to speak about the eight golden rules of interface design uh, with example. Yesterday we stopped speaking about consistency um, and we mentioned a couple of times that consistency is something actually good that we want to exploit. And we can have various kinds of consistency such as the internal consistency. So is this, is this a good example or a bad example of consistency? Bad example. Why? There are different labels, absolutely. So here you have, and, and, again, and again, we will see a few examples of this. So this is not rocket science. This is just speaking with the, the people doing the stickers with the, and making the people doing the stickers speaking with the people doing the user interface. It's not so complex uh, as a thing. Mm -hmm. So here we have a label here that is associated to this button that say enable title, enable the ticket, that like the, for public transport. And the other one that say info. And here, it say that the, this arrow is the um, ricarica, mm, so it's the, um, it's not recharge, but yeah, let's say that it's a recharge. Mm. So renew, let's say the, the, the ticket or put more money, etc. and instead here is called enable. And here it's a little bit better, but not a lot because that it say that the press the button that say information on the title and on the, on the ticket, on the card, and instead the button is just information. So this is a loss of internal opportunity, of internal consistency. And again, not, it's not something that is impossible to solve. It's just, and here again, is mentioned one more time, the wrong title. So either here, the system programmer that did this very small user interface didn't speak with the uh, designers or the people that does the stickers, or vice versa, but in the end they didn't speak. And so if you don't know anything of this, you came here and look for a button that say recharge, and you don't find it, because there is no button that say recharge. So by exclusion, you can say, oh, there is information here, so this should be information, and so that could be the other button. But it's still something that you have to think about. Instead, the goal of any user interface should not have you think too much about this thing, it should be immediate, or oh, you need to press the button, and it is. This is helping preventing errors, it is helping preventing a lot of things. And this, this user interface has another problem that is, let's say one, one more, not a lot. Yes, recharge here, it seems that you can put a card here to, to recharge instead, instead not. You have to, to do different things. Another thing, yes, this, this label is still misleading. Another thing, not about the text, but there could be a lot of things here, but one more. This button here with this arrow, which one is? There are two. So one is with the light on, so it seems the, the enable one, but actually there are two buttons here. This top one, this top two are useless in this moment. They could have not put this button here and everything would have worked in the same way. Hmm? So this is also internal consistency, another kind of problem with this machine. Hmm? And again, let me repeat it for the third time. It's not a really, really complex thing. It's just speaking with people 
and be sure to put the same label to avoid incomprehension, to avoid errors, to avoid people asking how, do, how can I do this operation. So going, creating queues uh, in the offices of people, asking the driver how can I do this, is creating more work for everybody, just one simple label that is not appropriate. So it has a, a huge impact, it's not just this. It can have a way bigger impact in complaining, in people asking information, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Elevators are fun. So this is, a, these are, we're going to see a few, a few pictures of elevators. Um, this is one. So consistency could, not, could also be internal or consistency with internal, with our mental model of how an elevator works or how a building is made. Hmm? So let's start from the top. If you press five, what do you expect to happen? This is an elevator. If you press five, two to go to the fifth floor. Four, same. Three, same. Two, one, air. Hmm? The reception, maybe, S, and minus one, because S could be under the floor, so one, minus one, and then minus one? That, that there is probably a, a reasoning or a motivation. This elevator actually work, but again, it's one other moment in which you have to say, wait, if I need to go minus one, should I press S or minus one? And S means, air could be the reception, it, maybe, but S and minus one? Who knows? And again, small changes. If this S is the parking, just put probably park, P as a parking, or put a drawing of a car, I don't know, something like that. Or minus one, if it's just minus one, like one is one over the floor, and minus one is back one, and S is minus two, is something in the middle, who knows. This is nicer. Um, when you, if you see this, what do you expect to happen if you press two or three? So, I don't know if it's visible, but um, zero is this one, minus one is on the left, one is on the, over the, the zero, two is on the right, four is over the one, three is on the left, and five is over the four. If you press two, what do you expect to happen? To go to the second floor, and why is on the right? And why three is on the left? And that was a normal building, like a normal building with the elevator with just one door that opened always in the same way. And so you don't have even, you, you're gonna say, okay, the second floor open on the right and the third floor open on the left. You, you don't have inner deals. Excluding that, but even if it is this in this way, that is minus one open on the left and two open on the, on the right, zero where opens on the top, on the bottom. Which, which is, this. if this is at the direction of the door, zero, four, five, and one, where does it open the doors, in which side? So this is something that you see in an elevator, say, okay, I'm pressing here, but you know what to expect. Then the elevator works, and you probably reach the floor, but you, you see this, okay, so I'm pressing two because I expect to go out or go in from one side or the other, or no, it was just randomly put in this case, in this moment, it was just an, a normal elevator. This is better. I mean, this worst, but. Which is the logic here? If you find the logic, 
I will listen. I, I don't see a logic. Because there is one, minus two, and then two. Just because yes. And minus three, minus four, and four. And then minus five, five, and six. And then seven, minus seven, eight, uh, et cetera. And then that means that it, this building has 12 floor under the ground level and 11 on the top, so it has more floor underground that... And, and these are actually real things, it's not made on purpose. So these are real elevators that exist in the real world. So this is, again, a mismatch with the mental model, and this is case, in this case is also error prone because it's so easy to press nine or minus nine because they are so close one another and there is not a scheme between one row to another. And if you press minus nine, if this is minus nine underground, clearly it's totally another place where you want to go instead of the ninth floor. So this is a problem of consistency with the mental model and also problem of errors in this case. Okay? Now, consistency with meta model, consistency with internal consistency, consistency of interpretation. Which one of these two buttons is the selected one? Later or now? Are you sure? If you need to put money, say, okay, you put 10, 10 euros that is now uh, or later, do you want to bet that is absolutely now? Or you have some doubts that could be later? But yeah, could, could be both, but actually one is the selected one and the other one is not. But that is a web page. So if you go on a web page or on a mobile application, you see those. Now, is selected later or is selected, which is the default one now? Selected. Which of the two? Could be both. You, you don't know and with this design, right? Because it could be now, it could be later, it depends on probably the other elements, uh, et cetera. So the color code in this case are ambiguous and there are no clues on which one is selected. Is the active one. So maybe if you press later, something else in the page change, like it allow you to select a moment later for the order, maybe. But this is, again, not something really, really complex, just the different choices of color, or giving some clue that um, this is selected or not. And also another question that we can ask here is, does this button is representing the current status or the status that we want to achieve? That means if I press now, so if I see this now, I'd imagine that now is selected. Is now is the current status or I need to press now because I want my order to be selected now, to be prepared now? It's a small difference, but we don't know again here. Uh, another example of this, think about uh, Zoom or Skype or whatever this system, the microphone, the microphone icon. When you have the microphone disabled, the, the icon typically change in a microphone with a bar on top, on, on it. But if you never, have never seen one of these, if you see a microphone with a bar, to press. It means that, that the microphone is currently disabled or means that pressing the microphone it, with the bar will disable the microphone. If you have never seen that and you have a, no, no other clues on the user interface, you don't know. If pressing a microphone with a bar means disabling the button, disabling the microphone, or that is the current status, so the microphone is currently disabled. So we, we have experience, we probably tried, we have other elements in the user interface that say disabled or not, but if you see that for the first time ever, you don't know if it is a status, 
is telling me that the microphone is disabled or is an action to reach the status microphone disabled. And that is a classical example of something that we use and that has this ambiguity in it. Because that icon change. And if we press the microphone disabled, it, the icon change in microphone enabled. But it's the status or the action we want to achieve, the status we want to achieve. Hmm? So there could be consistency or interpretation also of that. And with the microphone, it's basically not solved because many, many systems has this paradigm and show then a microphone or show you are muted somewhere else. But also this is one of the problem why people speak in video conferences when they are muted. Because maybe they don't see the icon, but they, see, they don't see the status, but they see the icon that allow them to be unmuted and think that is the same. So they, they exchange the status with the action to reach the status. And so speak when they are muted. Or say something that they shouldn't because they thought they are unmuted. They're muted. So that is also problem consistency. Solvable easily, just thinking, choosing different color, giving other views. And we said yesterday that inconsistency can also help if you use uh, Spartanly. So this is actually GitHub, the user interface of GitHub, where every, the settings, where every element has a title, a line, some text, some options, some buttons that are grayscale and black, some links that are blue. Consistency, a lot of consistency, a lot of the settings, which is good because they are options at the same level of importance. And then there is the danger zone that is not made like the others. It's similar, but not identical. It has a red border. It has button with red text. This is an inconsistency. If you have never seen this and you scroll the page for the first time, you will probably not read the merge button and all the options, but you will immediately notice that this is different from this other. This will catch your attention. Then maybe you are not interested in that but at least it to catch your attention. Hmm? So if you're used to use this interface, this will catch your attention. We say here something is different. Hmm? Maybe something different for good or for bad, but something is different. So pressing, you know that these operations are different from all the other ones. In this case, they are different because it's a danger zone. You can remove things, you can delete things, etc. So this is an example of inconsistency in a consistent interface that are all the settings that is made on purpose to draw attention. So when inconsistency is used specifically for something is, is very powerful because catch immediately our attention without too much effort to understand. You immediately see that there there is something different from the rest of the page. And then you can think about it if needed. Okay. Second rules, universal usability. Uh, so people has different needs and the interface should be able to adapt and the content able to be transformed. And these different abilities uh, are for sure people with disabilities, with permanent or temporary disabilities, but also other condition of users, we, we mentioned that uh, when we did the need finding. So you can have novices users, expert users. So how do you, how your interface is supporting both first timers and people that use the same system since 10 years? And similarly, young versus elderly. If you are targeting both, how the system speak to the young as to the elderly? Uh, and also web versus mobile. Is your user interface working on desktop computer with mouse and keyboard, etc., and it should also work on a smartphone? How do you support both platform, both interface, in a way that, that adapt to the specific, not only the people, but also the platform that they are? 
So web for mobile, web versus mobile is typically, mm, so responsive design is one of the things that help the interface to adapt web, desktop web versus mobile web, for instance. But there could be other things. So for instance, on a mobile, you have a series of sensors that you don't have on a computer. And maybe you want to rely, use those sensors to do something in your application. And it's something you can do on the mobile, you cannot do on a desktop computer. And then there is international cultural variation in a user interface. If you need to translate your interface in Arabic, you have to move everything, you have to change everything. A sentence written in, in, in English will have different lengths as number of character than the same sentence written in Italian or in Portuguese or in Chinese because of different norm, different convention, different words. And the user interface should adapt. It's not just I fixed 100 pixel for this sentence and now I am translating it in another language and we'll put it in the same place with the same space because maybe you, you need more space or the, the closest sentence will overlap with this because it's too long. So the interface should adapt to all these things, to people, to platform, to culture, to languages, etc. And also to uh, people with disabilities that, again, could be temporary or permanent. And an example of a tem temporary disability can you do an example of a temporary disability? Because for a per permanent, I think it's easier, but a permanent kind of disability in respect with the user interface? One injury. Yes, like I broke my arm and I cannot use my mouse anymore because I broke my main arm, so that could be one. Something that does not involve something bad, like having an injury. Color blind. That is one. Uh, color blind is permanent. Yes, actually. The temporary. Yes, that's, but color blind is not a, a, a bad. Let's say, well, depends. But um, it's not so dramatic like an injury. But it's permanent. Another temporary. Think also in general, not just a digital. Yes, you, you cannot use your hand, not because it's injured, but uh, let's say you, you have a child and you need to carry your child with you in that moment because it's crying, and so you cannot use your arm so that is a temporary limitation of your, of the expected set of abilities that our user interface and our physical interface will expect us to have. So universal usability, and we will speak a, li a little bit about this when we speak about accessibility, actually typically don't help just people that has permanent disabilities or get injured, but also people in those that are called situational hmm, uh, moments. So according to the context, they cannot do something because of and things. Hmm. And so supporting, being able to support some specific use case will be useful, not just for the extreme user, maybe people with extreme severe disabilities, but also for the immediate user. That is the contextual problem, like a mother or a father with a child in the harm that needs to do something, needs to open a door. And so the door cannot be too complex to open or need to, to click somewhere on the user interface. Offer informative feedback. So for every action, as a rule of thumb, there should be a feedback. Clearly not for every action, a pop-up that say, oh, you did that. Are you sure? That is a way invasive feedback. But according to 
the kind of action, the feedback should be made differently. So for frequent and minor action, it should be a very, very light feedback. We mentioned yesterday, when you uh, empty the trash bin on a computer, there is a sound. And there is the images of the trash bin that becomes empty, from full to empty. That is a feedback. That is a very, very small feedback, but still a feedback. A feedback that tells you that the action that you do was completed. In some cases, the feedback is the action itself. When you copy and paste something, the feedback on the paste is actually that you pasted the element. So every action should have a feedback. Visual, not visual, but light if it's a frequent minor action. If it's infrequent, if it's major because it's dangerous, it can be potentially delete things, it should be a stronger feedback. Like, are you sure that you want to delete this folder? Or are you sure that you want to close this document without saving? Hmm? Because that is a feedback to an action. And since the action is potentially destructive, is major, the feedback should be stronger to be sure that, to prevent, again, errors, also in this case. Hmm? And the visual presentation, but also sound, ca can help showing the changes. So we, we mentioned the, the trash bin, but also when you have, think about a button of an action that is not enabled, how does it appear? A um, disabled button, how does it appear typically? Yes. Hmm? So the enable button, disable button is grays out. And so instead of be color red, like the, the normal button is a different aspect to tell you that this is not some, an action that you can do now. Maybe it becomes enabled after a certain point, but in that moment it's not enabled. Hmm? Or highlight something. Hmm? When you, in a form, you move from one field to another, typically the field is highlighted as, as a border of a different color. That is a very, very light feedback. You don't even notice that but it tells you that you are in that field, and then if you type something, you are typing that in that field. And if there is no field with a border, and you type something, you don't type anything in the page, because there is no, feed, there is no feedback around the area that you are going to write in. So all these are small feedback, but are still informative and important feedback. Like this. Is this a good feedback? So for the not Italian speaker, they say problem in sending the message, minus one. Is this informative? No. What does it say about the problem? We don't know minus one what this means, but let's, yes, let's ignore the minus one. Let's, let's think about the message. Problems in, the, in sending the message. Which is the information that it give you? Yes. So it give you very, very poor information, give you the information that there are some problem, who knows what, and doesn't give you any hint on what you can do next or you can do in general. So it's a problem. So this is happen, this happened uh, in sending an email from the, the portale. That so we, we cannot they cannot send the email, basically, to, to students. But you don't know what to do next. So yes, I can click close. And then I can try again now, and that's the second time it works. I need to wait for a problem to be solved. There is a technical problem, so I need to open a ticket with the technician to say there is a problem. Or the message will be eventually sent after the problem is solved, so they are stored the messaging and sent, or I need to do everything from scratch. No idea. All of this could be valid, clearly. But here there is no clue on what happens. So this is not a good informative feedback. It's clearly a major action, because I cannot complete my operation. My operation is sending messages. I cannot do that. So it's, it's not a light feedback. It should be properly a big feedback. Red with the X to signal that is an error, and it's fine. But then the content of the message 
is totally useless because that doesn't tell me what I can do now, what happens, what will happen. This is another example of feedback. So if you're on Windows and you try to install Visual Studio Code uh, for all users on a computer, and you, so if you want to, to install a program as, uh, for all the users, typically you, you right click on the icon and press uh, run as administrator, and that for all the programs, for many programs will give you the possibility to install for all the user on the computer, not just you, you as a user. Hmm? So if you double click on this, it will try to install it for you, just you as the, the login, logged in user on Windows. If you select, typically if you select to run as administrator, it will allow you to choose if you want to install it for you or for all the user logged in, that can log in on the computer. In this case, Visual Studio Code has a very good, maybe not perfect, but has a very good informative message. They tell you this installer is not meant to be run as administrator. So, which is the problem? What happens? It's not meant. What they can do? If you would like to install Visual Studio Code for all users in this system, that is the typical operation you do when you want to run it as administrator, download the system installer instead, so you pick the wrong file, from address. So, which is the problem? This is not meant to be run as administrator. What it can do? If your intention was to install it for all users, you have to download another file from this address. So if you go there, you will install it. If it's not to your intention, do you want to continue with the non-administrator part? Maybe you make an error, you didn't want to run as administrator, maybe you selected run as administrator for whatever reason, but not for installing the software for all users. So that is, and so you want to continue because you want to install Visual Studio Code for you just, so you can continue and press OK. Or you can go on this web page and download the, uh, what's called system installer. And so you go on the website and you look for the system installer and download it. So this is a very, very good, maybe not perfect again, but very good as a feedback because tell you which is the problem. We, what you can do in the most common case that is installing it for all user and give you the next steps. Either go to the website or continue with a normal installation. How can we can imagine to improve this? I, I think that there is at least one way to improve this message. That is good, but. No idea? Make the link clickable would be a good step. Maybe it's not possible in this kind of pop-ups, I don't know. But yeah, making, bringing the person, maybe not just to the home page of Visual Studio Code, but a bit to the page where there is the download for the system installer, could be more helpful. So you want a system installer, click here and it will download it for you. Basically, instead of go on the website, look for among the downloads, look from the system installer, and then download the system installer for your operating system. You know which is the operating system because you are on it. You're running on it, so you know all the details of the operating system, so you can automatically download the right one if you want. So that is a small way to improve. This is, that is already a good message. Um, okay. Um, Design dialogue to heal the closure. That means that similarly to what we, we for instance, said for interviews, uh, we should always have a sequence on action that has a clear beginning and a clear end. It should be clear for the user of your application that that is the unique starting point of a sequence of action and that you have completed the action successfully or not 
with some development in the middle. So it should be, again, a story in this sense. I start a form, filling, and so there is five steps, and I know that I am step one, I know when I am the step five, that is the, the latest one, and I know that I am progressing in this, in this form. So there is this progression. And again, if we are able to provide a clear feedback at the end, telling that the form is submitted, that everything was done, or there was an error, and we need more information, and which are the next step, et cetera, are back in the informative things that will satisfy the person and delete the current task from their short-term memory. That, again, is something that we do automatically without thinking, but if we know that the process is ended, we remove it from our memory and say, okay, next one. If we are not sure if the process is sent, it is, is completed, we are looking from some indication, did I submit the form, there was some error, what is the next step? So we are not removing the current task from our working memory and we are waiting, looking for confirmation for that. So here there is an example. Um, so the text say you are mm, enrolled in a university for the academic year 2017-2018 and you are asking for EDISU benefits for the seventh semester um, and you can, uh, you can add to, to the request for the first year of the master degree. Are you interested? Yes, no. What happens when I click yes or no? When I select yes or no? Can, can we predict what happens? By looking, this is the user interface. You, you are this, on your computer looking at this page that appears in front of you. What happens when I click yes? Who knows? And it's actually who knows, because if you click yes or no, it is saved, it will immediately go to another page. We have no indication here what happens. Maybe if I click yes, it will appear a button, maybe not. Maybe if I click yes, it will immediately go to another page. And if I make a mistake, how can I go back here? And how many pages there are after this? How many questions there are after this? Absolutely no idea. So here, at minimum, there is the need of one button that say, okay, submit, confirm, next, previous, something, that tell us how we are in the beginning, we are in developing, we are in the end of this process or not. Then, prevent errors. We already mentioned that, but it's always better to prevent the possibility for a person to make errors with a user interface than handling the errors when it happens. Then there will be cases when you, you need to handle the errors, but preventing is always better. Because you avoid other parts of the processes. You avoid frustration. You avoid uh, problems in general. So, Preventing errors means, for instance, disable the things that are not applicable in that moment. So if you cannot click on a button, that button should not be either there or if it, it should be there, it should be disabled. Uh, similarly, preventing entering illegal charter. So if you are inserting um, an email address, let's say, why are you asking where you don't control if I insert character that are not valid as an email. If I'm asking for you for a number between zero and one million, why don't you prevent me to add letters? If the field is for numbers, it doesn't make sense to allow people insert letters. 
Mm? So instead of then checking, oh, is this field for letters, it has number, the number is valid, etc. just prevent the errors. That is easier also for the developer, actually, because it doesn't have to check everything later. Mm? Um, when it happens, because it will happen, some error, some problem, the instruction for recovery from the error should be simple, constructive, and specific. So again, feedback, identify which is the problem, how to solve it. And most importantly, repair only the faulty part. So if you have a form with 10 fields and one of them has errors, don't empty the form. Just highlight the single things to fix and keep everything else. An error should not, when possible, alter the application state or make it easier to restore. Again, don't empty an entire form just highlight where is the problem. So I, I'm sorry for all the Italian things, but we are in Italy, and people love to do bad user interface. Um, so here there is a login uh, page. Normally you get login page with username and password, and a button to login, and a nice picture. So here say warning. If the username is um, um, the fiscal code, then you have to insert it with the capital letters. Hmm? So, error prevention. Let's imagine that, so, well, here there is a serious problem. The first one is, okay, and if it's not a fiscal code, what can be the username? Because you say, if the username is a fiscal code, then insert it with capital letter. And so if it's not a fiscal code, which are the other options? Is an email? Is a username, random username? Who knows? But let's imagine that all usernames are, capital, are fiscal code. So why instead of telling this, don't allow, don't just do to, to capital, when you submit the form. I mean, it's not, again, really complex. You, you insert the, the fiscal code of whatever you want and have the software transform all the not capital letter in capital letter. And it's one function by default in every programming language, object-oriented at least, to transform a string into the capital version of that string. It's not complex, not machine learning in place. It's just really, really a small thing. And also, even if you have usernames, um, different usernames. Uh, fiscal code in Italy are easily identified because they are made on specific, uh, in a specific way. The first three letters are the surname, then the, the other two letters are the name, and then there is two numbers. That is the uh, here, of the bird here, etc. So there is a structure that is fixed. So even if the username is an email or a fiscal code, you can easily as a developer, understand which is the right one, because the email will not have uh, letters and string, we have at, at domain at a certain point, and the fiscal code don't. So you can easily understand in code which is the right one and capitalize the second, not the firmer. And then, well, there are other problems here, like uh, you forgot the password, click here, that is, this is bad to have one link with just one word. Here, here what? And the, the best is, uh, are you a health professionist? Register. And again, if I'm not a health professionist, I cannot register. This is just for health professionals. So why you have to ask me if I am a health professionist? Just say register. So there are a, a few things here that, in the end, it technically works, but can give you possibility, a lot of possibility to do errors and a lot of questions like, okay, I need to register here or not. I don't know, I am a health professionist. What does mean a health professionist? Is a nurse, a doctor, something that wor works in the health sector in general? We don't know. Um, so this is preventing error. Uh, partially connected to preventing error is permit 
Kizi reversal of actions. So all the action should be, almost all the actions should be reversible. So if I do something, I should need to be able to go back to the previous version, not to lost information. Uh, this sometimes is an extra development effort, differently from prevent errors, that typically is less development effort. Uh, but it relieves anxiety and encourage exploration. I am not worried to be wrong, to make a mistakes, or to do a wrong uh, request, because I can always go back. I can always check what I've written before submitting a form, let's say. And there could be different level of reversibility, so a single action, like the, do, the undo in the word processor documents, you can always do undo or redo or in, in tools like Photoshop, so you can go back in the history to go back to the previous version of your, whatever you were doing. Uh, it could be reversibility of a data entry task. Hmm? So I insert some data and I need to re restore the previous version. So it's not just a single action, it's more text, more content. Or it could be reversibility of a complete group of actions. Hmm? So a series of action that is okay, I need to delete all this action and go back to the previous part. Hmm? So different level, different uh, difficulties. Keep user in control. The interface should always respond to the person action hmm? so that it can avoid surprises and changes, do changes in familiar behaviors and again, provide undo, redo, cancel, confirm, so that the person is always in control or feel to be in control, hmm? also in this case. And we will see that these, actually, these are the eight golden rules, uh, but then at a certain point, we will probably speak about the guidelines for human AI interaction, uh, since we have one topic on this for the lab. And we will see that some of these, also we will speak about universal accessibility, universal user design and inclusive design, and we'll see that some of these rules are actually overlapped and repeated a lot of time, like preventing errors and feedback, et cetera, because they are so fundamental uh, that in all cases, in various cases, should be considered. I also consider these are principles, so they are widely applicable to different domains. Uh, This is our university that provides us one more example. Um, we cannot do, we, we could have problem doing the course without all the example that Polytechnic could give us. So as a teacher, so you, you do the, uh, the questionnaire of end of the course. As students, we also do the questionnaire end of the course as teachers with different set of questions. And one question that it was um, last year for the exam, was, as a teacher, which problem did you add in doing the exams? And you can choose one or more of these options, so you can select also all of them. And the first option was, I, don't have, I didn't have problem. And the second option was the organization of the exam, uh, or I don't have software or hardware needed, etc. So since you can select multiple like, options, I can select I didn't have problem and a specific problem. Clearly, because why not? Mm -hmm. So this is a, a wrong question. Mm -hmm. so if I, these are actually mutually exclusive, so either I had one problem or I didn't have any problem. I cannot contemporary have a problem and not have any, any problem. So, so this is an example of keep user in control. I, I don't have control here. I can, I, can, I can also do a lot of mistakes. Which information? So if Polytechnic will get this information and I select in this way, I didn't have problem and I had problem with the organization of the exam. Which is the information that the Polytechnic can get from me? Who knows, again is that I really didn't have problem and this is a mistake or I had problem in the organization of the exam and this is a mistake or I didn't have any other problem except the organization of the exam. All possible options that doesn't allow the people that needs to have this answer to actually do something 
after reading the, the answer. So this is basically useless, made in this way. And finally, reduce, reduce short-term memory load. So as a rule of thumb, people can remember seven plus minus two chunk of information at a time. Hmm? That means if I give you nine number, nine numbers, for and have you watch numbers for let's say one minute and then delete numbers, you will be able to repeat some of you all of nine, some of you just five of these numbers, some other seven. If the number are 20, almost nobody of you will be able to remember all the 20 because we just can remember in our short term memory, clearly we can study this number and learn by memory, but for a short time, we can remember seven plus minus two pieces of information at a time. Typically women nine and men five, but this is not um, a, a strict rule, but it happens more frequently in, in other cases. But seven is the medium number. Given this rule of thumb, the information on screen should not be needed, remembered, in the next screen. Since we can remember seven plus minus two things, the less things we need to remember to use a system, the better. So if I have a screen that asks me information, and then the next screen should not rely on the option I selected before, because that means that I need to remember what I selected before. And if we are, again, in a form made of 10 pages, at the 10 page, I cannot pretend that the person remember what I selected at page nine, eight, et cetera. Uh, so examples, uh, if possible, collect the phone numbers from address book instead of asking people to put the phone number. Uh, if I have, have a very long form, if I cannot with interconnected questions, probably it's better to keep it on the same page, they connected question instead of splitting them because it will not allow, it will allow me not to remember, just scroll up and see the information. If they are strongly, strongly connected, if they are instead independent, they can also be put easily in multiple page. So these are just example to reduce the short term memory load. So let's have a look at this. Do you know what is this? What is this? It's the, yeah, this is the Google login page. So we said that you don't have people to remember um, things from one page to another if they are strongly connected. But if you want to log into Gmail or any other Google product, you actually, what happens is that you insert your email, press next, and then it asks you for your password. And so you have to remember, it's, it's written here, but you have to remember which is the information you inserted before. It's not, why is not here? Why is not written? Why is not here, like in the other fields? Why we don't have here password? Is this? A good thing, some bad things, it has some motivation, it's acceptable. Yes, they, they make it written here. So actually this is the, the username, but um, let's say that you put the phone here and this is the, the, the username. So let, let's imagine that this is not written here, okay. They split the password from the login information. So in theory, you should remember it. So this is a violation of the principle we just mentioned because you have two connected information to separate page. They solve this problem by writing it, clearly. That is an acceptable way to solve the problem. Since, since they split the username from the password, they add an extra portion of text that repeat the same information written here. No? So they are repeating this information here. But this is an extra effort. So why I, do they create a new page reporting on information I added in the previous page? 
Why? It was, wasn't simpler to have here the password instead of reporting the same information in a new page? The reason motivation is actually good, is as an appropriate thing to be done here for Google, but why? So it's not a, an error, it's not something that they did wrongly, but apparently, we need to move information from one page to the other, is asking for the password, instead of asking for the password directly here. This page doesn't have any new information that cannot be either fitted here or available here. It's just another field. And here, you can add two fields. Why the split the login in two phases? Not only for make easier, yes, not only for make easier to switch between different accounts, but also, so yes, the problem is that this same login can support different account, but not only different Google account, also different non-Google account that use Google systems. So in this case, when you insert here, when you insert here your email and press next, what happens is that they check if you are logging in on Google or you're logging in with, let's say, Polytechnico. That is not using Google, but let's imagine that it is. So the identity provider is different. So if it's internal, they will show this with the Google login on the Google system, etc. If it's not Google, but another one that uses a Google education business system, then this password will not go to the Gmail system, but it will go on the university organization company authorization system. So the same user interface, just a different process. If they kept that in the same page, immediately, that appear immediately, they shouldn't know they get the password, Google get the password before, can see the password before sending it to the identity provider. And then also this is useful for switching uh, account if you need to, if you make an error and you need to go to another account that you had. Uh, yes and no. Uh, yes, I get the point. Actually, also in this case, it will tell you that either username and password is wrong, and not that is. Um, you did the, the web application one course with who? Okay. Um, so that is. Uh, I think that I mentioned that. I don't know. Probably Fulvio didn't. Um, so that is made on purpose, actually, for security reason. Just not to say, okay, you make the, the username wrong, or the email wrong, or the password wrong, because that hints, that gives hints to an attacker to know which is the right one. So if I say there is the wrong password, okay, I got the, the username correctly, I can focus on getting the password. If I tell you the password, well, I cannot tell you the password correct if the, if the username is wrong, clearly, uh, but in that case, I, you tell 50% of information that they, they need to tell to enter your system illegally, unforcibly. So you say, okay, the username is right, the password is not, I will focus on the password. Instead, if you say the username or the password is not correct, you don't, don't give this piece of information. And for the user perspective, it doesn't change a lot because of this, or this, or re restore your password, or reset your password. So if you don't remember which one is the correct one, you can reset your password, and in that moment, it will say, the email is not registered, and you, so we cannot reset your password, so you can try another email, etc. So in that case, but that, this could be done also in the same form if you want, it's not needed to be, to be split, just checking one field or the other. But that, that specifically is made for more security issues than not um, the other kind of issues.
okay? Um, so here there is another exception uh, in which we, we have a long list of certificates with a long list of scores to select. And this is clearly overwhelming. If you need to select the first certificate with score 10, where do you need to scroll a lot here? So which is a better alternative for this? Instead of a drop-down menu. Yeah, a free form is probably to free because here probably the information that it wants is Cambridge first certificate in English, open parenthesis, the, the numerical score, the, the, the letter score, and minus score and the score. So you probably need information in this, well, sort of structured way, not always, but sort of structured way. Um, so I can have maybe different steps, like select the certificate, select if you get it from 2015 or before or before 2015, and then enter the score. That is a number in that case. So in this case, it should be restructured in three, probably different. If there are three, the information that we need in three different moments, with this being probably the default, because at least in the screenshot happens just in two cases out of millions. Another option, instead of the totally free form, so here we have a totally not free form, and in the other case we said a totally free form which you can enter text as you like. Something in the middle? A drop down? Yeah, three separate things, okay? And, but if you want to keep one, one, one entry point, not separate. We, we need something like the free text form, but there is a but. We also need, we can also use validation with all free form text, yes, but to help the person to write the right things, let's say, the things that they need. Yes, I can validate and say, no, you didn't write correctly, you have to write in this, in this way, this is not to error prevention, this is in solving an error, if you want to prevent the error and still have some clue of the, of the format. Autocomplete. So autocomplete are typically a mix between drop-down and totally free text in which you write and autocomplete the text. So if you write Cambridge's first certificate, it appears and then you select and then you write score one and it will appear all the things with one, not the things with two. So it will help you narrow down the, the search, but also splitting these in separate field is more than appropriate hmm, in this case. But there are alternatives with pros and cons for each of them hmm, in, in general term, also in terms of errors and prevention of errors. Then there are other design principles, a part of the eight rules. Hmm. So for instance here there are the same principle by Benion uh, that say that the principle is that are actually adapted from other principle. Uh, the principle is again learnability. And this design principle split learnability in four things. In visibility, ensure that everything is visible so that the user can see what functions are available and don't, they don't need to remember. So back to the remember thing. Consistency, here we are again, same as before. Familiarity, use the language and symbol that intended the audience with familiar wit that were um, somewhere in these also mentioned, familiarity. Use the proper language. Hmm? Affordance, the same thing that is so clear what they are for, so buttons should push. Though. We said yesterday, end all of the door, 
if it needs to be pushed, it should be easily recognized as pushed. That is a for dance. Hmm? So map the perceived property. I see something, I think that is a button that is my perceived property of the object with how they actually work. Hmm? Again, if you think goal for execution, et cetera, what we said yesterday that is in line with this. Uh, effectiveness, hmm? navigation, again, control, we mentioned control already, feedback, we mentioned control. So you see, these design principles are slightly, are declined slightly different from the previous one, but they have huge overlaps one with another. Hmm? So we, we focus with a lot of example on the eight golden rules. There are other design principles organized in a slightly different way, focusing more on some things than on the others. This is focusing more on effectiveness versus um, learnability. So it gives you two categories, and then decline the effectiveness in navigation control and feedback. And for instance, we didn't have explicitly spoken about navigation uh, in the, the Schneiderman principle, in the hate golden rules, but if you think support people in moving around the different sections, et cetera, is still something part of the give a clear entry point, a clear beginning of a set of action, and a clear end of a set of action. So this is also part of navigation, helping people to understand where they are, what are the next step, the previous step, et cetera. So there are a lot of overlaps, just they are written in a slightly different way. So here, for instance, there is navigation and control. What I need to press here if you want to accept the evaluation, the, the things that is selected? Confirm or next? Or both? What happens if I press next without pressing confirm? Can I go back here? And if I press confirm, can I change my mind? And I go automatically next? We don't know, again. So this is sort of misleading because it doesn't tell how to move forward or to move backward from this and how to go back from error, how to give control, etc. So probably here there was next and previous put there and this part was changed at a certain point they added the button in this part but without thinking about the full navigation of the page. And then there are other principles like safety or recovery, that is recovering constraint, again, error recovery, prevent errors, and again, flexibility, that is universal uh, usability. And they add also something about the style and the conviviality, so to be attractive, nice looking, et cetera, that is not something that were present in the other principle. And also the polite, friendly, pleasant, no interruption, when not needed, that are not included in the other principle, and the other principle include things that were not here. So again, a lot of overlaps with some specific differentiation, but more or less are, um, let's say, simple or let's say overla overlapping principles from one to on the other. And finally, um, among the principle, other principle, there are seven normal principle uh, from transforming difficult task into simple one, not task like task analysis, just task on an interface that you need to, to complete. Hmm? So the suggestion were use both knowledge in the world and knowledge in the head, that is the mental model, but also the knowledge that exists hmm? in the world that is standard, like this handle is made in this way because we know that this handle is made in this way. So this knowledge in the world. Uh, simplify the structure of a task. Instead of making something really, really complex, try to split, divide and conquer in a way. Visibility, make things visible. Get the mapping right. That was navigation as before, but not only. Um, exploring the power constraint, both natural and artificial. Mm -hmm. So s metaphors for constraint for things that doesn't work. Design for errors designed for preventing errors in this case. Design knowing that you will have some errors at a certain point, and so you can tickle it, and if you prevent, uh, it's better. And 
relate to standard when possible. So if there is a standard way to do things and you don't know how to do, follow the standard way to do things. Maybe it's not the best way to do things, but it's still a way. So which is the standard way by, by, by default, not, by, not because it's the best option ever, to hide a sidebar on a mobile web interface, which is the icon that is used. Always, or almost always. To hide and show a sidebar. The three lines. That's called the hamburger menu. That is the name. So that is sort of standard. So if you want to know how can I make a sidebar in a menu, visible or not, with one icon, which is the icon that I'm going to use? The hamburger menu. Not, again, not because it's the best possible idea, but because it's sort of standard nowadays. So it's immediately recognizable by people that if you click that, you, or if you tap that, you see a menu appearing, and if you click again, you see a menu disappear. It's sort of normal. So you expect to work in this way. So if you have a standard like that one, feel free to use the standard things or the common things. That is also both knowledge in the world and knowledge in the head. We know that how this button work, so we can use that. And then there are other principles of interaction design that are linked here. We're not going to, to all of them. But if you see something like, I don't know, consistency again, discoverability, efficiency, that is connected to the effectiveness part, um, simplicity, state, uh, visible interfaces, visibility again. So there are aesthetics and colors, etc. So we are not going to see now this principle. Uh, we're going to see some of these things uh, when we speak about visual design. We will speak a little bit about color, about aesthetics, uh, clearly. Uh, metaphor, the hamburger menu is clear a metaphor for something. Learnability is something that we mentioned among the design principle, etc. The fits law is, I hope that is something we can cover uh, next week, etc. So these are other set of principle that are available, but most of them, again, can overlap with the principle that we have already mentioned, okay? So just to recap, we spoke about the theory yesterday, more general, more abstract. We spoke about the design principle, a little bit more concrete and widely applicable. Next week, we will briefly speak about the design guidelines that are very, very, very specific to a uh, given domain, way more specific, way more applicable than design principle, but only applicable on specific use case and specific domains. So different domain have different guidelines, typically, while design principle are common. If you have any question, I'm still here for five or 10 minutes. Otherwise, have a nice rest of the week. <laughs>